Hello and welcome to the second installment of Ancient Greece. This is part two, Development and War. Uh, again, I am Coach Bowman, your world history teacher. Hopefully you have your part two notes there beside you or in front of you. And we are about to begin. So uh, again, this is part two, Development and War of Ancient Greece. When we look at uh, the development of ancient Greece, we start to see uh, a slow but consistent uh, development uh, looking at the economic side of it, um, agriculture. Now, you might have said, hey, coach, last time you said we didn't have a lot of agriculture. You don't have a whole lot. There are, there is, try again, there is some, but not a lot. Uh, it is very limited. The, the land around Greece is extremely rocky. It's uh, very limited arable land, arable meaning farmland. Um, but what they could grow, they grew a lot of, and that is olives, citrus. Uh, citrus would be oranges, lemons, limes, grapefruits, as well as grapes. Um, there were a ton of these things when I was there. They were still growing them left and right all over the place. And because of that limited amount of farmland, the Greeks had to trade. And to do so, uh, they began uh, spreading Greek culture, which is known as Hellenic culture, um, all throughout the Aegean Basin region. You will also see that during this time period, the very early developments of Greek trade, you see a shift from a bartering system, barter means you trade item for item, to a monetary system, meaning actually using currency or coins uh, to pay for something kind of like what we do today. So here's an image of uh, a vase, but on the vase itself, you see people gathering olives. Uh, again, a lot of these items that the Greeks grew, they were able to um, use as, as multiple types of um, types of ways. For instance, olives, you can get the olive oil from, citrus, you can make the juices from, grapes, you can dry to make raisins or actually make into wine. So there's a lot of things that the Greeks would do with the produce that they were able to grow. Here you have an ancient Greek coin. This actually comes from the city of Athens. Uh, I'm curious, maybe you know why. Maybe looking at this image uh, of what looks like an owl, you know why it's from Athens. For those of you that aren't sure, the owl, which kind of ties into our last PowerPoint, is the image of, or the animal that is associated with the goddess Athena, who was the guardian of Athens. Uh, it's kind of the reason why today uh, we still think of, I think of the Tootsie Roll Pop commercial. Uh, Mr. Owl, how many looks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? Why do you ask an owl? Owls can't talk, but in this cartoon, they can. And you always think of owls when you see a cartoon with an owl. He has a graduation cap on, so he's educated. So again, goddess of wisdom, Athena, owls, there's your connection. So this map, you can see the mountainous uh, areas throughout Greece, uh, but uh, again, those mountains caused problems. Uh, it did give some protection, but at the same time, it caused uh, a problem for unity. And so these individual city-states start to develop where they could, and these were known as a polis, P-O-L-I-S. Uh, today in the United States, there are several cities with that ending, you have the capital of Maryland, and you might think, Coach, Baltimore doesn't have polis at the end. Well, you're right, and nor is Baltimore the capital of Maryland. It's Annapolis, uh, which is at the top, the northern part of the Chesapeake Bay is where you'll find the Naval Academy. And you also have Minneapolis, which is the home of the largest mall of America, which actually houses a roller coaster. You have Indianapolis, home of the Colts as well. So the word polis you will see uh, means city-state. 
And as I already mentioned, uh, the mountains, even though they caused problems like not allowing uh, the development of unity with the different locations and city-states, it did provide protection. I'm beating myself to each of these lines. Again, preventing unification, major problem, causes individual city-states to develop. Right. However, what you're going to see is these Greek city-states are going to be very interesting um, when it comes to uh, using the weather. Their climate was a very uh, warm climate along the coastlines. Of course, if you're in the mountains, it's going to be a little cooler, uh, but uh, definitely use that Mediterranean warm breeze to promote uh, outdoor life, outdoor markets, public markets, what's called the Agora. Uh, this is where you would go, it's kind of like what I would think of as a flea market. Um, but again, you'll go to see people debate there. You'll go to see uh, court cases. Uh, instead of turning on TV, watching um, Judge Joe Brown or Judge Judy, uh, you would go to the Agora, A-G-O-R-A, um, to, to watch these things happen. But again, uh, it's kind of, I think, in essence, kind of go to um, the Agora for shopping as well. So that's what's left of the Agora today. This is one of the, the places we stopped at. As you can see, uh, again, um, as I showed you in the first PowerPoint, uh, they don't leave any room. Um, they build the modern stuff right next to uh, the ancient. So as we were talking about uh, trade, we also need to talk about what's called colonization. Uh, when the Greeks would go and uh, travel to look for uh, different resources. Um, you know, some of these city states became overpopulated, so they had they wanted more space, so they would go elsewhere. As uh, you can see in this map, there uh, you have a little indication there that this is around the year 550 BC. Um, so we're looking about um, 2,500 years ago. Uh, a little rough there on that. But um, again, uh, all these different locations were uh, colonies of ancient Greece, uh, and they would send and trade back and forth to other city-states throughout these colonies. We start to notice different social and uh, structures as well as citizenship. Uh, citizens were the free adult males uh, throughout Greece. They had political rights, and, and they were expected to, to participate uh, a lot of times, you know, people um, don't choose the right to don't choose their right to vote, and it, it's it's tough to truly represent the population if people don't vote. Um, however, in, in ancient Greece, women, foreigners, and enslaved people uh, were not considered citizens, and so in turn, they were not given the right to vote. Um, so it didn't matter, ladies, if 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 who your dad was and who you were married to, how much uh, wealth your family had, you still had not, you did not have a right to vote. You did not have um, that responsibility. Now we're going to take a little case study, a uh, look at Athens and Sparta. For Athens, uh, we are talking about um, the city and how its government changed. It evolved. Uh, it started off as a monarchy ruled by a king. Uh, and a lot of world history, if you look throughout it, uh, monarchies don't last very long. They start off as a great idea and they mean well, but uh, things change. Uh, eventually, you have what's called an aristocracy. Um, you have an uh, aristocrat. Uh, who are the uh, wealthy, the nobles, landowners, the upper class that would rule over the majority. Uh, again, not the best form of government. Athens would go through a period of what's called tyranny. Uh, these individuals would take over and gain power by force. Those individuals would become known as tyrants, which we'll discuss here in a little bit. Eventually, they would land and create a type of government that still exists today. We definitely demonstrated that. Uh, actually, we are still demonstrating that currently, uh, where the citizens have the right to vote. Uh, the way the Greeks did it became uh, the foundation for how our democracy is today. 
as I said, you have certain tyrants uh, that came about. Uh, and again, you might want to truly pay attention to those different stages of Greek government or Athenian government uh, styles because that has been on the SOL multiple times. Uh, so please make sure I would definitely kind of uh, star that. Uh, make sure you memorize that one. So who were these uh, mean tyrant gentlemen? If I lose that, use that word loosely. Uh, first one was Draco. No, not Malfoy, you Harry Potter nuts. But uh, it might be the reason why uh, she used this character's name. Uh, Draco decided that the law codes need to be tougher. And so he had really, really harsh punishments uh, for those that broke the law. Obviously, too extreme, so they had to change. You have another tyrant who came to power known as Solon. Uh, Solon's big achievement was the fact that he outlawed debt slavery. Uh, debt slavery is where if you owe someone money, you had to work it off, and it was up to that individual to release you from that debt. So the, sla the slave period, slavery period could last for a while. So from Athens, we get basic democratic principles of what's called direct democracy. That means your vote directly affects the outcome. Uh, we see this in our on our ballots when we look for yes or no type questions. Do you want to change this? Yes or no. That is a direct democracy. We see public debates. We've had that here relatively a lot, uh, as well as the fact that a citizen uh, has a responsibility. Now, Athens' responsible, responsibilities for a citizen is very different opposed to what today is in other city-states in ancient Greece. For Athens, it was more of a, um, you, you have the right to vote, but in case of war, Athens would call upon you to become a citizen soldier, kind of like a National Guard type position, that you would have a job and you would be a productive citizen, whether you're a blacksmith, a baker, a carpenter. But if push comes to shove and they need more soldiers, you would put down the tools of the trade and pick up the weapons of war. Speaking of, we switch to the city-state of Sparta. Sparta, very fascinating city. Uh, the movie 300 kind of brought that to a more modern culture, more modern spotlight, oligarchy was the style of government that they had. An oligarchy is basically ruled by a small group. You can think of like a council. Um, and you would have a king. You have King Leonidas there making sure you are aware of where Sparta is on, on his map. His sword is pointing to it. So King Leonidas would be uh, the head of this small council. But their social structure was very rigid. You definitely could tell uh, who was in the government in the Spartan civilization, who was in the military, and who was not. Very clear cut. And Spartan society was very different. Uh, it wasn't as, um, as, as educational. It wasn't as academic. I think that's probably the best way to put it as uh, Athens was. Uh, Sparta would be more of, if you were comparing it as a college, Sparta would be like your VMI, whereas um, Athens would be like your UVA, put it that way. Um, so very militaristic, very aggressive society. There's a lot of things that Sparta did that uh, a lot of students aren't aware of when it comes to their society. For instance, um, if, if children were born with deformities, physical deformities, uh, that they would be killed. They, uh, the Spartans saw that uh, a citizen of, of Sparta had to be in a, in a perfect physical form. And so uh, if, if there was some type of deformity, uh, that they would be killed. Um, I would have not, I would have been killed. Uh, my, when I was born, my right foot was bent up. So where the top of my right foot was touching my shin, uh, eventually without having to do surgeries, thank the Lord, um, I, I was, the, the foot came down and everything um, was normal as normal can be. 
Uh, fellas, at the age of seven, you were taken away from your parents to attend military school. You would begin your military training at the age of seven. So um, first grade, you were gone. You left home uh, and possibly not to come back home, um, if, especially if you were killed in, in the line of duty. In order to become a citizen, and this is a big, big difference between Athens and Sparta. If you were to become a citizen in Sparta, you had to survive and serve 20 years in the military. Very, very different than Athens. So those are the two city-states. Uh, you have a really good comparison there of the two. Uh, one very aggressive, one uh, very academic. Uh, and so this is going to lead into what we call uh, the Persian Wars. Uh, the Persian Wars are a series of wars uh, that were fought between the empire of Persia as well as ancient Greece. They were um, the big thing that was up for debate was trade on the Aegean Sea. It was your money maker. Uh, the Greeks controlled it because they had colonies. If you go back and look in this PowerPoint and look at the colony map, you will notice that the Greeks completely surrounded the Aegean Sea. However, as Persia continued to grow, as we talked about in our last in the last unit, um, Persia started expanding further west, starting getting into the Greek colonies, and so the Greeks had to retaliate to defend themselves. The big thing that um, happens that really truly devastates Persia is the fact that uh, Athens, the city-states of Athens, Sparta, and many, many other city-states were actually united. Um, the, the barriers, the mountains caused, the different cultures, as we just got done looking at Athens and Sparta, um, those differences were put aside. They all had a common enemy, which was Persia, and so uh, they decided to put those differences aside to defeat the, the invader of Persia. There are several battles that we're going to look at, uh, the Battle of Marathon. Um, here's a little diorama or diagrams of what happened here. Um, the Battle of Marathon is where we get the race in, uh, marathon from, that the 26.4 20, um, uh, miles, um, or I'm sorry, 26.2 miles. And so when, um, very fascinating, it was a Greek victory. The Greeks were truly outnumbered, but as you can see in this map, uh, the style, the tactics were used to uh, use the Persians' aggression um, and their numbers against them against the Persians. And so um, it was a huge, huge victory. And the, uh, the general at, uh, the Greek general at Marathon, once they won, uh, sent a messenger back to Athens, which is about 26.2 miles. There's your, the reason for the marathon. Uh, back to Athens, and uh, according to legend, once he got back to Athens and told the good news, uh, the messenger died. And so to honor not only the victory, but also the messenger, the marathon became part of the Greek games known as the Olympics. Another major battle was called the Battle of Salamis. It was a sea battle. Uh, I kind of used the idea of, of playing with that word. I think of the word salmon. Um, but as you can see in the uh, map here, uh, it was a huge, ma ma massive, massive naval battle. Now, very different uh, what we think of as a naval battle that we've seen on TV. Uh, again, wooden ships, you would crash into each other. Um, and so it was a very different style. But the Greeks win this one as well. So you have these two massive, massive battles that the Greeks uh, win. You also have the Battle of Thermopylae. This is a famous battle where uh, the movie 300 takes place. The 300 Spartans, as well as uh, other, other Greeks, were able to delay uh, the, the Persian military um, from attacking the city of Athens. Athens does get destroyed eventually, um, but the Spartan sacrifice and the, the Greek sacrifice there at Thermopylae allows... The, the citizens to evacuate Athens. Uh, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a huge sacrifice um, and uh, one that um, 
save thousands, if not tens of thousands of lives. All right. Um, but even though it was a Persian victory, uh, it, the, it was a victory of a battle victory, but not of the war. So what is the aftermath? What happens because of Persia? Well, again, because of the major victories of Marathon and Salamis, the Greeks win. Uh, they do defeat Persia, and as we talked about before, the Persians were never able to capture Greece. And so Greece maintains control of the GNC. They main, maintain control of sea trade and uh, continue to keep their independence and we will later on go and see um you know from from this time of peace after the persian war uh the huge benefits of, of creation and creativity that occurs uh after the persian war and that's going to end part two uh next time when we meet again part three we're going to talk about the major contributions uh, areas like art history poetry literature and a lot more thank you for turning tuning in and i agree, greatly appreciate everything and uh, be safe and until next time talk to you later